We are in Madrid, Spain. Part of your career kick-started at El Bulli. So what can you tell us about the influence of Spanish cuisine on what you're still doing right now? Oh, to talk about the influence of Spanish cuisine on Noma, the, it's a long story because you have to, under, you have to go back in time and understand in, um, in, the 19, in the 90s that in that time, as a cook, French food was the only thing you looked towards. You thought that you were going to cook French food in, um, in Denmark. That's what I always thought to myself. And so when I arrived in Spain in 99, when I worked there for a season, it was like everything that you had been taught before, all your rules that you knew were sort of thrown away and you could start plan and build and dream in a different way. So in a way, it's, it has given me the very seed of everything that's become Noma, started with, with just seeing a different path. Does it still apply to you today? Do you still feel that kind of influence, that kind of thinking? Now, after 20 years, it's just grown into you, like in your DNA. Um, so it's still there. Yeah. There's been a bit of a parallel between the, the influence that El Bulli had on the chefs who worked there and the influence of Noma on the chefs who worked with you. I think, you know, er, er, no matter who, uh, no matter who you are, even Ferran or even and myself, you, you come from somewhere. The collective of you belongs to a lot of different influences, and in the case of mine, one of the main influences that gave me my kind of, I would almost say, philosophical drive in cooking came from uh, how what I got out of Ferran and my experience at El Bulli back then. And, um, and I'm ever grateful for that. We stand on his shoulders and others will stand on my shoulders and Ferran stands on somebody else's shoulders that I don't know who is. Um, and that is how things move forward, you know? And I think it's extremely important that we just keep remembering whose shoulders we stand on and that we remember to, uh, to talk about it. Do you, do you tell your people about Ferran and what, what happened at El Bui back then? Yes, but the, th the problem is that people can't understand it. If you are a young cook and you've only been in cooking for 10 years, Ferran has been closed for, what, eight? Right? Um, so, so it's 11 years ago. Oh, shit. Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> but as you can imagine, uh, it's hard for people to understand it. It's like when you tell people uh, a simple thing could be, oh, you know, 10 years ago you could smoke in all restaurants. Uh, 15 years ago you smoked in the planes. People don't, it doesn't make any sense to people. Um, so I try to explain this, obviously, of course. I say it everywhere I go always. When people ask me these questions, you have to let people know uh, how you've become uh, the one you have been from a professional standpoint. And El Bulli was one of the major influences. I also have other influences, but in that sense, uh, Spain and El Bulli opened a new way of thinking for me. Whereas before, I thought I was going to be in Denmark cooking French food, which is nothing bad about that, by the way. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. But that's just what I thought would be. Everyone thought that. It was the only way. There was no other way. Most people in Spain can go to Noma because it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. Most people may think that it's an expensive and a provocative uh, restaurant. Uh, what would be your, uh, your, your, your thoughts for this kind of people? I think um, people are right, it's expensive. <laughs> Um, but I, I genuinely think all food, not just at Noma, is too cheap. Uh, I really believe that. The real cost of food is in a different league than what we all think of. Um, but on the other hand, I also think, you know, be open to anything. And I think everyone should try a restaurant like Noma in their own country once in their lifetime. I really, really think so.
I think it's like going on a journey. I believe that this is something that gives quality to your life. Mm -hmm. Many people may have seen the picture of the hunted bloody duck in a, uh, over the table. Uh, do you think that uh, is it representative of what Noma uh, cooks? Yeah, we do it every season, so it's very representative. Okay, and what's your intention with, with it? Several things, you know. Uh, it's as simple as surprising people when they eat, but it's also bigger than that because we also want people to understand that you, when we eat things, there has consequences. And we should think about it. And why is it so dramatic and so ultimately uh, provocative to see a head when you see the flesh of the same animal? That's not no problem, but the head is a problem. And I think. In the, there's a long uh, fight to be had, which is what is the value we have towards food? We have distanced ourselves from the food that we eat so much that we don't know anything anymore. And for me, that is actually a giant problem. And one of the main problems that we have in food is that people don't have any connection anymore to where the food comes from and what it is. Today, it's so easy to throw away things. You eat half a sandwich, I'm not hungry, you throw it out, you know. We have everything at our fingertips. There might be, you know, uh, five slices of hamon, but if you knew the pig that this hamon was came from, you, I'm pretty sure you would not do it, you know. If you're reminded that something actually living is right, it was right there for you to enjoy a moment, you know, let's, not, let's be respectful, let's not be wasteful. I genuinely believe in the power of these stories so that we can connect ourselves to our food again. I think it's very, very important and I think we don't have it enough. I wish these things would be as natural incorporated in school education as math and learning. Seasonalities, where does our food come from? How does uh, uh, a steak get to our table? You know, I think this is important. Magnus Nilsson from Fabiken, he always said that he believed that uh, uh, everyone should have a driver license for meat so that before you uh, start eating meat you actually have to go and participate in a kill and let's then make your decisions on how you f f what meat do you buy what value system do you choose and so on and so forth it would change things I, I feel that Okay, I can uh, talk about a very big mistake I made for many years, which is uh, a part of the biggest mistake I've made in my career. And it starts with, not so much Ferran, uh, <laughs> but it starts with every place I worked, um, in kitchens, you would always go through this very tough, uh, kind of almost brutal regime. Um, it is the way it's always been. Kitchens are tough, the head chef is is the one who shouts, everyone is uh, obedient soldiers. Um, and sometimes you would experience things as a young cook, plates flying through the room. We've all seen, uh, seen it and heard of it. And I always told myself, I'm never gonna do that. Can't they see it's not working? And then when I opened my own place, suddenly I felt this energy bubbling in me, like a change, and I didn't know how you know, I would become upset. The small things would become disasters. Mm -hmm. And I would go home and say, I don't know what's going on. I can't control myself. And I had some years where, where I was very angry and I became the thing I said I would never be. And so to, to, uh, to, for me to have a moment, almost like an epiphany, mm -hmm. to say, I need either to change this or uh, I, I'm leaving, I'm gone, you know, I have to finish. Um, 
and then starting to implement the change. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest lessons I've learned, and it has been the biggest reward as a well. Milestone yeah, in a your huge career. milestone. Mm -hmm. um, since the cover time with Atala and Tan, um, how have you changed, and how have the fine dining industry changed? It's changed dramatically. I mean, it's changing all the time. It's changing right now, today. It's changing this year with the war in Europe, you know. Where is it going to be in a year from now? I actually have no clue. I can't even say anything. Um, I think there's going to be less attention on fine dining, rightly so, mm -hmm. on less attention on food innovation for the sake of innovation. Okay. Um, that's what I think. Uh, there's just too many other things that's happening. There's too many other stories that need to be told that are important, that needs, that needs the space. Also within food, you know. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, of um, somebody cooking ramen for refugees in Poland or mm -hmm. something, you know what I mean? That's a different innovation that comes in. How do you do it? And it's a different style of innovation. So it is really changing. And uh, during the pandemic, this worldwide phenom phenomenon happened. Everyone in the world that had the opportunity, they have been thinking to themselves, am I in the right place in my life? Should I change something right now? Uh, I don't know anyone who didn't ask themselves these questions. And so there's a huge movement in the restaurant industry. Uh, in Denmark, you can't find a nurse anymore. Uh, because everybody's kind of like, reviewing their life, saying maybe this is the moment for me to go into something else now. And uh, that is also going to change our industry dramatically uh, over the next years. Okay, last one please. Um, are you loyal to your suppliers? Do you have people just researching on suppliers? Yeah, we have. And we've had that for more than a decade. More than a decade. More than a decade we've had one person fully uh, dedicated only to suppliers. And right now, for the past three, four years before the pandemic, there's two people just uh, devoted to the suppliers. And I am quite loyal. Some of the suppliers <laughs> we have, we've been with them uh, a for a long time. Since we opened some of them. Some of them we worked with for 20 years, of course. Wow. Um, but as anything, two decades can change a lot of things for people. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I have a few of my staff that we worked together for 20 years mm -hmm. and some of them uh, they've had uh, so one of them has four kids and two divorces <laughs> you know it changes yeah. people mm -hmm. um, and uh, and suddenly when somebody has twins for two years they have to work in a different way they can't work like they used to Absolutely. so there's a constant change and I think um, this is a uh, one of the things that I like about my life is that we always have to be we always have to adapt to new things and we have to be flexible and moldable to always go into a new situation and just say now the world is moving we have to move with it and we have to change ourselves let's do it okay, thank you very much. Yeah. how do you think that the nordic cuisine I thought he was Danish. <laughs> no. <laughs> he looks Danish. <laughs> I'm really pale, but I'm not Danish. La nordica, como afecta la gastronomía? It's gonna last from yeah. the nordic gastronomy. From yeah. the cuisine, the cuisine. Because do you think that it's going to last and be recognizable for a long time? So Maybe not in the world, mm -hmm. but uh, I think in the world it's not so recognized. It mm -hmm. might be recognized within the fine dining, but you don't see how many Nordic restaurants are there in Madrid? No, Zero. But, but I'm not talking about Nordic. There's no about process, about uh, the style of maybe the, the thinking about this kind of food. Maybe you know Montia in Madrid. Has I think I think in that sense, it will just become naturalized. Mm -hmm. People ask the same thing about El Bulli's uh, uh, reference, and people say, "Oh, well, no restaurant is using espumas anymore." Mm -hmm. But that's because people don't understand the influence and the philosophies that is now completely naturalized in every corner of gastronomy. And I think maybe there will be parts of this that will enter and become naturalized as a part of the ongoing DNA. Mm -hmm. um, I hope fermentation will be that, because I genuinely believe in the power of that.
Following up on the fine dining question and also this question, but in a way I think fine di the techniques of fine dining have become like part of uh, most of the uh, average restaurants, yeah, you know? Right. Like, so in a way that's why there is maybe less attention for fine dining because people maybe now are more demanding and they want those kind of techniques in everyday meal almost and they go out to a restaurant apart because from fast Because everyday restaurants have become so amazing. So now the spread is like... Yeah, the distance is not like it used to be. Um, you used to go to the best restaurant to get the most tender piece of meat uh, and the perfect ice cream, you know. When I was growing up in restaurants, getting a vanilla ice cream without crystals in it was only at the best restaurants or, uh, you know, that steak cooked to perfection. You go to every neighborhood brasserie and you expect tender steak cooked to perfection. You expect ice creams to be fantastic and so on and so forth. That has really dramatically changed. So the distance between the fine dining level and the next level might not be as high as before. And the fine dining uh, sphere is moving more and more into more experiential kind of experiences to surprise people. More theater, more, you know, more and more and more and more. Yeah, something that you cannot offer every day in the other restaurants. So there is a, yes. there's a bit of a premium uh, difference to you offer. You have to have that premium difference because today, you know, caviar, you get it in airports. It's airport food. A Wagyu, uh, everyone can get it. For instance, with some of these typical luxury ingredients, you know. Um, the quality of cooking is so high the best bacalao is not necessarily in the best restaurant anymore. It might be in, in, a, in a tapas bar, you know, because the chef worked uh, four years with uh, El Bulli and then six years at another place. And there's been a huge, in that sense, I hate the word de democratization because it sounds too hyperbold, but there has been some sort of flavor spread, quality spread. I believe so. It, Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay. Thank super. You so Thank you. Thank you.